A, we have one of the most lethargic characters in literature who has turned laziness into an art form. He's not just lazy, he thinks being lazy is deeply philosophical and profoundly artistic. Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov, published in 1859, depicts Russia's ultimate superfluous man whose ultimate question in life is not to be or not to be, but to move or not to move, or more precisely, to get out of bed or not to get out of bed. He's not some Taoist monk who preaches inaction or lives with the flow, but he's a Russian aristocrat who sleeps all day, barely managing to move between his bed and his chair. Thinking hard work or thinking hard itself is overrated, so he leaves all the decisions and choices to someone else to make. But first, who is Ivan Goncharov? Born in 1812, only 20 days after the Battle of Borodino against Napoleon, Ivan Goncharov's father was a wealthy green merchant in Ulyanovsk province, 700 km east of Moscow. Like most of Russia's wealthy class, he went to a French boarding school. When he was 10, he went to Moscow to enter a commercial school. In 1830, he attended Moscow University to study literature and art. Like all other Russian writers, he was blown away by the poetry of Pushkin. In 1835, he moved to St. Petersburg and worked as a French translator, but also got to know a circle of literary figures. In 1847, he published his first novel, The Same Old Story, juxtaposing the country people's romantic outlook against the western pragmatic city people. Does this remind you of a Pushkin story? Of course, in Eugene Onegin, Alexander Pushkin tackles the same theme. In other words, the warmth of the country people versus the cold of the city people, a theme common in other Russian novels like War and Peace, Fathers and Sons, and so on. In 1849, he published a short version of Oblomov, which was criticized by Russian traditionalists as it depicted Russians as lazy and Europeans or Germans as hard-working people. In 1850s, Goncharov traveled around the world, including the UK, Africa, even Japan, as well as within Russia. In 1855, ironically, he worked at the censor office in St. Petersburg, where he helped writers like Turgenev and Dostoevsky publish their work. Due to an illness, in 1857, he traveled to Marienbad, modern-day Czech Republic, where he wrote Oblomov, his masterpiece, which was published in 1859. He later returned to his censor job and also became part of the government and grew more conservative in anti-nihilism. In 1869, he published his third novel, The Precipice, in which he challenges Russian nihilism and its anti-artistic sentiment. It's a little similar to Turgenev's Father and Sons, but criticized nihilism from an artistic perspective. Some consider it his best work. Goncharov was a slow writer in the mold of Gustave Flaubert, publishing a novel every 10 years or so. He planned a fourth novel but never finished it. In 1891 he died, aged 79. He never married nor had any children. I blame Arthur Schopenhauer, inflicting so many writers and artists not to pass life's miseries on to another soul. Later in life he had a huge falling out with Ivan Turgenev, accusing him of plagiarism, which some argue was due to his insanity. Ivan Goncharov, after reading Nikolai Gogol's satirical tale, especially Dead Souls, which I discussed here before, worked on Oblomov for nearly 20 years. Bits and pieces of it were published at different times, but his travels, work, and life in general interrupted his flow, which perhaps also inadvertently allowed him to distill his idea into a gem of a novel, one of the best of Russian literature. His travels around the world in particular allowed him to see other countries and people so he could judge Russia from a distance. The result of that 20-year writing and rewriting is one of the most original novels of all time. What is the story? Summary The story is told through a third-person narrative and is about a young man, Ilya Ilyich Oblomov, a Russian aristocrat with a huge country state conveniently called Oblomovka that has a lot of land and serfs, like many other Russian nobility at the time. With Russia being so big, Oblomov's country state is like a thousand kilometers away from where he lives. Well, what's unique about the man is his new technique of managing his state from his bedroom. He's not sick or disabled, but he sees no point in leaving his bed, traveling for miles, because he can do everything from home and more specifically from his bed. He has taken laziness to a whole new level. Could. With Oblomov, lying in bed was neither a necessity, as in the case of an invalid or a man who stands badly in need of sleep, 
nor an accident, as in the case of a man who is feeling worn out, nor a gratification in the case of a man who is purely lazy. Rather, it represented his normal condition. Whenever he was at home, and almost always he was at home, he would spend his time lying on his back. Remember, this is 19th century Russia, so there's no internet that you can turn your bedroom into an office. Oblomov would have thrived if he lived in the age of broadband. But in those days, men had to get out to do something. Russian culture at the time, and even today, champion hard physical strive. So Oblomov thinks going out in the field is just too old-fashioned. He gets the news that his country state is experiencing financial problems and needs urgent attention from the man. This is not good. But Oblomov is religious about his technique of never leaving his bed. So what does he do? Instead of going out there to resolve the problem or consulting an advisor, he consults his subconscious self. He falls asleep and dreams. His dream takes him to his childhood. Such a wonderful time it was. He was free to do whatever he wanted. He was never asked to do any work. He had zero responsibility. We have all been there. But what's more, he was coddled by his mother with lavish holidays and gifts. It's important to note that his father was not involved in his upbringing, so he was with his mother most of the time. In other words, he was lacking a disciplinarian character in his childhood. I think Goncharov himself lost his father at a young age, when he was 7 years old. So he knew the importance of a father figure in a child's life. So he contrasts Oblomov with another child who has a strict father. Oblomov's school friend is a half-German boy called Andrei Stoltz, who lives a miserable life because his parents, his German father in particular, are extremely strict with him. Stoltz is a disciplined, diligent and hard-working man. Goncharov is making a point here that the Russian elite was lazy and the Germans were efficient and hard-working. Even today we have the same stereotype about Germans' efficiency. Oblomov's half-German friend Stoltz comes to wake the lazy man up from his wonderful dream about his childhood. But he cannot convince him to get out of bed. Oblomov is stuck in his ways. But there's one tried and tested technique to make a man get out of bed and work hard. Introduce a woman in the mix. Andre Stoltz brings Olga, a young beautiful woman, to rouse a deeper motivation inside Oblomov. At first, Oblomov doesn't know what to make of her and she too is intrigued by a man in bed all day. What's wrong with him? Is he disabled? But slowly the two get to know each other a bit more and we all know what happens next. They fall in love. A man would do anything for a woman he truly loves. We are romantic animals after all. A man can conquer the moon for a woman he loves. It's time for celebration and some champagne or vodka. We can save Oblomovka state and maybe Russia too. But unfortunately the celebration was a little too premature. Oblomov is not just lazy, he's deeply religious about it. Olga tries everything to move the man out of his bed. She works really hard, but he's glued to his bed sheets. She keeps asking him, where are we? When are we going to get married? We need to talk. But Oblomov has a way to deflect all these tough questions and negotiations. The fear of marriage is deep inside every man unless he thinks he's found the only one. Oblomov keeps telling her that he loves her the way she is and why can't she love him for the way he is? Oblomov has a point here. Why can't a woman love a lazy man? Why do women only love ambitious men? Well, society doesn't improve if men stay in bed all day. Someone has to do the work, someone has to collect your rubbish, someone has to run things in society. Olga tries to convince the man to get out of bed and do something. Have some passion and ambition. Oblomov says his ambition is to stay in bed. His passion is asleep. What's wrong with that? Finally, Olga has had enough. You can move a mountain, but you cannot move Oblomov. She calls the engagement off. No woman wants to marry a lazy bugger. Despite calling the marriage off, Olga later on, even after her own marriage with someone else, still wants the man to change. Maybe it's in a woman's DNA to change a man, to push him to have ambition and goal. But Oblomov is the true champion when it comes to laziness. No woman can change him. It's important to note that Andre Stoltz is Oblomov's only good friend. Everyone around him is either a thief or a crook who steals his money left and right. If only Oblomov lived today, he would have installed some CCTV everywhere so he could watch everyone from his bedroom. But we are in 19th century Russia where you have to go around and physically watch your employees. His only eye is Andre, who helps him find the crooks in his state every time. 
but even he is unable to undo all the damages. At one point, Andre Stoll says he has had enough, so he ends up traveling to Paris. Here's a little twist in the novel. Guess who he bumps into in Champs Elysees or some other Parisian streets? Surely it's not Oblomov, the man is permanently in bed. You're right, it's not him. It's the beautiful Olga, the woman who tried to motivate Oblomov. But now she's in Paris. We are in Paris, the most romantic city in the world. Guess what happens? I guess when you meet someone abroad, there's a different feel to it. So the two fall in love. Forget about that lazy bastard Oblomov. We are in Paris, baby. They marry and they settle in Crimea, near the Black Sea. Meanwhile, in Russia, Oblomov has had enough of his so-called friends who swindled money from him. He gets up and slaps one of them before telling him to pack his bag and leave. Well, that was something, so perhaps there's a hope the man might get up from his bed soon. But unfortunately, he doesn't. What does he do? He marries a widow landlady, Agafia, an older woman who looks after him. She cooks his food exactly the way he likes. She takes care of him just like a mother would take care of her baby. Oblomov is now married to the greatest woman in history and lives without any worry in the world. His dream of going back to his childhood is realized now. The man lives his days in bed and his nights in bed. Agafia doesn't ask questions, doesn't tell him what to do, and she herself does everything as the man wants. Because she thinks Oblomov is a smart man. If you don't have to get out of bed, why should you? Goncharov here exposes that the elites of Russia didn't have to work hard because the peasants did all the work. Agafia, however, thinks Oblomov is onto something with his lazy lifestyle. Soon they have a child whose name might bring tears to her eyes. Oblomov, despite his philosophical level of laziness, admire his diligent, hard-working friend. So he names his son Andre after Andre Stoltz. Not only that, Oblomov has an explanation for his laziness. He reasons he is suffering from a rare condition which he conveniently calls Oblomovitis, which means he cannot help staying in bed. It is an invented illness, of course. So Oblomov, despite being the laziest man on the planet, manages to invent a disease to cement his name in human history. Even in bed, you can achieve something. Oblomov dies to return to his heaven, a place that allows you to sleep forever, where nobody can wake you up, nobody can disturb you. There's no worry of someone stealing your money or how you manage your state. So philosophically speaking, Oblomov has a profound idea that life is nothing but an interval between two perpetual sleeps, one before you were born and one after your death. So he remained in bed to make sure he was ready for death, forever sleep. The novel ends when Andre, his friend, adopts his son Andre. Hopefully the future is looking up for Russia, now that we have a half German raising the little Andre Oblomov. Analysis Ivan Goncharov masterfully exposed the psychology of the Russian landed gentry as it was dying. The novel is like a canvas that unravels mostly through the dialogues of its characters, so the author has taken a minimal role in narrating the story. Instead, he's let the characters speak for themselves. And speak they do. They tell everything about a system on the verge of death. If Dostoevsky talked about the new ideas coming from Europe, Oblomov is quite the opposite, it exposes the illness of Russian society. 19th century Russia was going through rapid modernization. There was a new class of educated Russian intellectuals that were considered superfluous in the eyes of ordinary Russians, because they weren't doing any hard work. But Goncharov pokes fun at the landed gentry class as lethargic and lazy, which was holding Russia back. To give a little historical context, two years after the publication of this novel, the serf system was abolished in Russia in 1861. And six years later, slavery was outlawed in the United States in 1865 to give you a little global context. So there was a global movement towards a more liberal egalitarian society. The old system was breaking down and Oblomov personifies how lazy the system was and how much people wanted change in Russia. Dostoevsky liked Oblomov but disliked Goncharov, likening him to a petty official with an empty head. Goncharov was actually an official in the censor office in St. Petersburg. But Dostoevsky had a habit of insulting those so ideas he didn't like. Dostoevsky's notes from underground is his version of Oblomov who has retreated underground in state of inertia as he calls it. 
But Dostoevsky's character is not critical of Russian traditions, instead he criticizes Western ideas. So Dostoevsky's notes from underground is his response to Oblomov, saying that what comes from the West is not all good. Yes, European science is useful, but when it comes to how to run a society and individuals having a meaningful life, European rational nihilistic ideas were destructive to Russia. Goncharov's juxtaposition of half-German man and a lazy Russian nobleman is an important one here. But if you look at the subsequent historical events in Germany and Russia, there is an interesting contrast. In 1917, Russia went to the soft, cushiony economy of socialism, in which everyone was equal and nobody needed to work too hard because everyone got the same amount. At least on paper, in reality of course it was highly unequal. But 15 years later, in 1933, Germany went the opposite route, fascism, in which everyone worked extremely hard to make Germany productive and you got what you worked for. Socialism and Nazism differ in many ways, but when it comes to hard work, socialism is about taking it easy. Marx famously said, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, and criticize after dinner. In other words, you don't have to focus on one thing, but do things you enjoy. Nazism, on the other hand, promoted a winner-takes-it-all mentality. Aside from being a social satire, Oblomov is also a psychological novel. He is attached to his childhood when he lived in total oblivion to the problems of the world. As a grown man, he has seen how terrible the world is. Quote, Having done with the cares of business, Oblomov liked to withdraw into himself and live in the world of his own creation. He was not unacquainted with the joys of lofty thoughts. He was not unfamiliar with human sorrows. Sometimes he wept bitterly in his heart of hearts over the calamities of mankind and experienced secret and nameless sufferings and anguish and a yearning for something far away, for the world perhaps where stoles used to carry him away. Sweet tears flowed from his eyes. He is a man in search of his lost childhood, lost time. Change Marcel Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time is considered one of the greatest novels of all time. Its central premise is how time changes you and how memory fights back. Oblomov's dream is the same. He wants to remain a child forever, if not in reality, at least through his memories. Quote, memories are either the greatest poetry when they are memories of vital happiness, or a burning pain when they touch dried wounds. Ivan Goncharov, just like Marcel Proust, understands the nature of time, how it changes you as if you are a different person. Here is another quote, Yesterday one has wished, today one attains the madly longed for object, and tomorrow one will blush to think that one ever desired it. This became the main theme of Proust's novel, how time is changing us and how we die many times throughout our lives as we change and grow. Children cannot wait to grow up, but Oblomov, upon growing up, realizes it's a bad deal. A lot of responsibilities and not enough fun in the moment, so he wants to return to his childhood. This is very similar to The Catcher in the Rye by Jerry Salinger, which I discussed previously. Children live in the moment, while grown-ups have to live in the future. To work for the future needs motivations and resilience. Resilience is taught and instilled into child. Oblomov, however, is like a willow leaf, trembling with a little wind. He has grown up without care and as a result has become too weak for his own good. To toughen up, a man has to be taught, disciplined and put to the test throughout his childhood. Oblomovitism Laziness basically boils down to conserving your energy. Pandas and sloths and humans all try to take the paths of least resistance. We don't want to work, fight and struggle if we don't have to. So why do we get out of bed? Well, outside survival instincts like eating and procreating, evolution has also put a chip inside us, it's called boredom, which propels us to get out of our arses and do something. Oblomov lived during feudalism when the vast majority of people had to toil in the field. Today, however, the economy has shifted to less active working conditions thanks to machines doing the hard labor jobs. As a result, people have grown bigger. So today's Oblomov is not a rich landowner dude, but more those at the bottom of socioeconomic ladder who have access to more readily available and healthy food. Stress eating is a phenomenon today where people overeat due to psychological stress or anxiety. Oblomov points out that when you don't have a purpose in life, you live day to day. Quote, 
When you don't know what you are living for, you don't care how you live from one day to the next. You are happy the day has passed and the night has come. And in your sleep, you bury the tedious question of what you live for that day and what you are going to live for tomorrow. This mode of existence is common today where people buy things they can't afford just using their credit card, fueling a consumerist lifestyle. When you feel empty on the inside, you fill it with something. But laziness is not all bad. Laziness turns to boredom and boredom triggers creativity. So I say be lazy until you get bored then turn that into something beautiful. Oblomov invented a disease. But more than that, he gave us a deeper perspective on laziness and sleep. We slept for millions and millions of years. Then we lived for a little while, which he himself spent in his bedroom. Once we die, we return to perpetual sleep that lasts millions and billions of years. So life is being awake for a while. Whether you spend it in your bed or somewhere else, leave it to the fullest. Oblomov turned laziness into an art form, which is incredibly profound and beautiful in of itself. Thank you for watching.